Maurice Ravel, one of the great composers of the 20th century, uh, he was commissioned by Diaghilev to do a ballet, Daphnis and Chloe, premiered two years after The Firebird. Very much the same cast of characters, the same choreographer, the same dancers, um, the same huge orchestra, except uh, Ravel added a chorus besides the huge orchestra, a kind of similar type story. In this case, it was a, a story about the love between Dathis and Chloe, and Chloe was abducted, and then through the intervention of Pan, who was uh, the, the god of playing the flute, uh, and his love for the syrinx, the, the, uh, Chloe was found, and Dathis and Chloe lived happily ever after. More or less something like that. From this great ballet that Ravel wrote, he created two suites. And Ravel used basically the first part of the ballet for suite one, and the second part of the ballet for suite two. Suite number two is the one that's done the most often. The piece begins in the most remarkable way. The woodwinds, two flutes and then two clarinets, play these incredibly fast notes. One of the most important orchestral excerpts for these instruments and hard and fast and soft. The harp playing glissandos underneath that and the double basses just underpinning the whole thing with a kind of melodic gesture, not a melody certainly. It is an incredible moment. It creates such an atmosphere. It is just uh, about to be daybreak. You can just feel how the sun is about to come up. And uh, Ravel uses this melody. And this melody can go on forever. It's a kind of melody that you can repeat over and over again uh, and just keeps going. But if you think of that little gesture, this little melody, uh, and if you orchestrate it, put it in different instruments and do it in interesting ways, it can be a glorious moment. And the, the little bird comes in the piccolo and the solo violins. So as, as the day break, and the sun is coming up, and the birds are there, shepherds start to be seen coming through. Obviously they're getting up and getting ready to take care of their sheep and, uh, and doing their job in a sense. Uh, you can hear this little solo from the piccolo and the little solo from the E-flat clarinet. We have a group of herdsmen come in. And for the herdsmen, Ravel uses a slightly different melody. I mean, you can hear the similarities. So we have all of these filigree, the glissandos of the harp, these melodies that are being developed, but nothing, no great gestures yet. And some new material comes in, uh, played by the viola and the clarinet. And you can feel that what's happening now, of course, is that Daphnis is trying to find Chloe. Now, if you didn't know that, it wouldn't matter. It's just... It's what was needed at the moment. You could tell musically, after all of this, all these beautiful gestures, you can't just do beautiful gestures forever. And he gets a little, a little agitated section. In the story, Daphnis is uh, looking for Chloe, and she appears surrounded by the uh, shepherds.
In the next juncture of this ballet, um, we get to the part where, of course, Chloe has been abducted. And now Pan is helping uh, Daphnis to uh, find her. In fact, they kind of re reverse roles. Daphnis becomes Pan, and Chloe becomes the syrinx that Pan loved. Uh, and it leads to the central section of the uh, piece, which is this incredible flute solo. The greatest flute solo probably ever written. Very simple accompaniment, pizzicato string, second or fourth horn, harp, and this beautiful flute solo. The flute solo becomes more and more agitated, and uh, eventually uh, Chloe falls into Daphnis' arms, and it's this mini concerto for flute section. So you, you see the first flute playing a cascading scale, and then the second flute picks it up. The alto flute is the final one. It starts with the piccolo and works its way down in the section. And then, in fact, what Ravel does is he continues that and it continues to be uh, a, little, a little flute section, a concerto, right in the middle of this piece. A phenomenal use of the instruments. Finally, it comes to an end, and uh, at this moment, uh, the nymphs are, are falling in love, and they pledge their love for each other, and they dedicate uh, some uh, sheep to their, to their uh, joy together. And it is represented by this somewhat gorgeous chorale. This leads us to the first inkling of the fast section, because everything to now really has been relatively slow, a build up for the flutes, which is, and then it comes back again, and then we have this little corral for the sheep and the, and the shepherds. The women of the company, in this case the dance company, enter to do a special general dance. It starts out in a, where, where the music that is going to permeate the rest of the piece is sounded, but only a few bars because immediately it comes back down and we hear that same uh, beautiful chorale, a solo for the alto flute, and then the general dance begins. This is the dance that's basically in five. There are a few moments that are in three, but basically in five. So it's five beats per bar, accent on two. And that in itself is unusual.
At one point, uh, after this tremendous buildup, like any great composer, he could have ended it just there. Instead, he brings everything back down, everything back down to the essence, which is the rhythm, and in a very soft way, the snare drum and the double basses play this and it starts over again. And uh, it's, it's so interesting that composers do this because you know it could end, he brings it back, and then when it does end, it's even more exciting. And the end of the Adathus and Chloe second suite is among the most exciting pieces of music one could ever hear, using every seven percussion, four trumpets, four f flutes, oboes, English horn, clarinet. I mean, it's a huge orchestra and full of what we know of Ravel one of the greatest orchestrators of all time.